our past message or uh, conferences. You know, we usually ended up in a park somewhere. There was a softball game and a lot of heat and sun and then snooze. So anyway, we'll do the best when we'll have a good time. Romans chapter 4, if you will. While you're turning there, I will say hello to you from the Saints at Southwest Bible Fellowship. We are in the Tempe area. We're in the Phoenix metropolitan area, fifth largest city in the United States. 200 people move there every day. We're very busy. Please don't come. If you like to come, come in July, August, or September. If you come in the winter, we trick you. Because in July, I left Sunday to come here. It was 115, 40% humidity, 60 degrees on the dew point. You know what that means? Nothing works. Okay? So you get in your car, and by the time you get home, the AC has just decided to work. So if you're going to come out and visit and to stay, please come during July, August, September, okay? Uh, I have, we have folks come out all the time, and they go, oh, man, this was wonderful. Well, yeah, it's December. And then they come in July. Oh, this is miserable. Yeah, it's July. So anyway, but we would do, I will say hello to everyone. Uh, my group ought to be online. If they're not, I give them a test next week, and we'll see what happens. But uh, anyway, Romans chapter number four, if you will. Uh, when we got the little email about what, pick a topic, so forth, I went with real living, and I, I'm, we're going to move, we're going to use Romans 4.17, and then we're going to depart from it, but we're going to, I want to catch a phrase with you, okay? Look at 4.17. Now, contextual, Paul's dealing with Abraham and the issues of faith and justification and so forth, but I want you to see the language here, because the language that Paul uses is very critical. Verse 17, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. So, been talking about Abraham, okay? Before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead. All right, and are you ready? Because this is what I need you to focus in on. And calleth those things which be not as what? though they were. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the evening. We thank you for the folks here and their desire to study and to look into this and to hopefully reset our thinking about some issues. In your name we pray. Amen. My goal this evening with you is the end of that verse. Calls those things which be not as though they were. In the, in the reset of our thinking, as we look around what's happened over lifetimes, not just the last couple years, I remember this meeting. You had, we used to have Daryl Medford. Many of you know him. Some of you don't. You missed a great guy. We had Mel Derry. We had Mr. Baylog. That's how he was. We had a lot go on. A lot of people we stand on shoulders here. They've passed on, promoted to glory. A lot of the guys here, I appreciate the messages, sit and get in. And I'm, I got to thinking about that. How does God view things? I know how I view them. But how does God, look at the, what does that verse say? The end of that verse. What does he do? He calleth those things which be not. Now, again, we could run to Isaiah, we could run to the Old Testament, we could beat the dog down that he's God and there's none like him and he can tell the future and it's going to happen. I'm not going to do that with you. I don't want to waste your time. Well, studying the word's a waste of time? No, not at all. But that's not my goal. My goal this evening with you is to just look at some things that I know you are familiar with. And do it with you thinking about, adjusting your mind, resetting your thinking to think like God thinks. How does God think here? He calls those things that are not, 
right? Are you seated in heavenly places right now? No, you're not. You're sitting here in Chicago, Illinois. Yeah, it was a trick question. On purpose. So, okay, we sit here. But where does God have us seated? In the heavenly places. I want us to kind of just think about that as we just really remind ourselves of some sound doctrine. I, I, I listen to Alex, and I apologize, but I do. And he, he made a statement one time years ago. Sound doctrine learned. And that stuck with me. We learn stuff, don't we? But we usually sometimes struggle in the application of it and in the movement of it. Mel Derry one time said, and this is what kind of got me, we're not put here to be remembered. We're put here to prepare for eternity. I got the, that sound doctrine learned. There was a, a thing in the paper year, a few years ago about Billy Graham. He was in his late 90s. He was going to uh, have a big party for a birthday or something, and he had bought a new suit, and it was a big hubbub. But he, as he got up to make a little acceptance speech, he said something very interesting. He pulled on a story of Dr. Einstein being on a train. And in the story that he told, Dr. Einstein, the ticket conductor, comes around and is punching tickets. Einstein can't find his ticket. He's looking. Where is it? The conductor says, don't worry. I know who you are, Dr. Einstein. Don't worry about it. So the conductor goes on. Einstein's on the floor looking for his ticket stub. Conductor sees him and goes, Dr. Einstein, don't worry about it. We, I, he goes, young man, I know who I am. I just don't know where I'm going. Okay? Now, I know we know who we are, and I know we know who we, where we're going, but do you live it? Do you think it? Does it fill your mind? Does it grip your mind? Does it take your mind and just saturate your life? And that's where we're headed. Billy Graham went on in the story and he says, I not only know who I am, I also know where I'm going. However, life without God is like an unsharpened pencil. It has no point. And I like that. I was like, there you go. Why? Because if you don't have sound doctrine learned, and then, let me rephrase it. You have sound doctrine learned, but you fail to think like God thinks. Then guess what? There's no point. Because it's not, work, it's not going to work. It's not going to activate. It's not going to influence you. It's going to just be sound doctrine learned. Come over to 2 Corinthians 11. So that's where we're going. That's introduction. So here we go. 2 Corinthians 11. I want us to know not only who we are or where we're going, but I want you to grasp the idea of uh, and, and just get the concept. He calleth the things that... Not, that aren't here, as what? As though they are here. Now, I'm adjusting the verse. You give me that leeway, I hope. But what, you, what I want you to see, look, look at 2 Corinthians 11. And this verse, to me, liberated my thinking many, many, many years ago when I was a little boy, you know, okay? 11.3. We were just jumping in. But I fear lest the serpent... Less, I'm sorry, I, but I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Everything we're going to do, I can't walk that way. I want to walk that way so bad. Okay, I'm walking this way. Sorry. Okay. I can't get too far, and I get it, and, and I appreciate it. The simplicity that's in Christ. Everything we're going to look at tonight, you are all familiar with. I'm not going to do some brain surgery with you. I'm going to do some mind surgery with you. Because there's some things that we understand, we hold true. We fight over, we go. And yet, when you back up and you look at your life, you examine you. Paul says, examine yourselves. You know what happens? You don't think like God thinks. You're thinking the way you would think rather than having that word transform 
your mind. Look over with me at Philippians. Come on over to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. At home, this is, I teach this all the time with our folks. Little different manners, little different subjects. Look at Philippians 3, look at verse 15. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. What's the perfect there? Maturity, right? Growing up. The Philippians are mature believers. They are adults. They're not acting like adults in Philippians. They're for the, the reproof. But he says, hey, let's be, if we're perfect, let's be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Now watch, nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. There are sound doctrines that you and I understand. We stand for, we fight over, we won't give up ever, and yet we don't think about it the way God thinks about it. We think about it in our fleshly mindset. Come over with me to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. And you say, okay, Rick, what, you know, just hold on. Don't email me yet. I'm going to give you something later to email me over. Look at, actually, you know what I do? I forward them to David Reed, so <laughs> I just forward and let him, let him deal with them. You. No, you're welcome. <laughs> Romans chapter 3. Look at Romans chapter, um, yeah, Romans chapter 3. Just think about this. Here's the wonderful book of Romans. Foundational doctrine. Establishing the believer. Starting the edification process. Here's the doctrines of grace. The gospel. Your identity. Your walk. Your justification. Your, your interaction with the, the other members and, uh, and uh, relationships with the church, the body of Christ, other members, all of it. you got all, every gamut, every facet of your life is in the book of Romans. And yet, how often have we been under, as Br- Brother Smith the other day talked about that issue of fear, improper thinking about something, allowing stuff that's outside there. Do we know the end of the story? Let's pray. <laughs> then why do, why do we, and I say we because I get there too, act like we don't know the end of the story? Look at 3.9. What is God, in God's mind, now let's just see what, th- we're reading the word of God, so then what are we reading? God's mind. The thinking of, the mind of Christ the thinking of the Godhead. Your scriptures is the work product of God the Holy Spirit. That's his job. And he produced it. And he, using holy men as as the Spirit, and here it is, right? What does verse 9 say? Here we are in the courtroom, hammering out the issues of justification. Really, why justification is needed. What then, are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all what? They're all, what's God's view about mankind? What are they? They're sinners, right? Do you think about those that you come in that are lost as who they are? Who, what are they? They're sinners, John chapter number 3, he says that they're condemned already. So then why do we struggle with topics that come up about certain issues? And we go, oh no, what is, it, is it this or is it that? No, what's the book say? What's the mind of God say? They're, they are sinners. I love verse 19. Look at 319. 3.19, now we know that, the, that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Think about the courtroom. Here's Paul pro- prosecuting the case of, of, against the sinner, against humanity. And what, what is, you know what the, father, the judge says? Shut up. Just shut up. Why? Because what's man done? Man's been throwing excuses, hasn't he? Chapter 1, chapter 2, just excuse after. You know, he finds, just, 
have you ever done that with your kids? Shut up is a bad word in our house. So it's be quiet. He stops the mouth. We just, just stop. Now watch the next verse. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin, but now the righteousness of God. You see how he shuts them down? Look at how God's thinking about this. Mankind's a sinner, and yet what do they need? They need the righteousness of God, don't they? But they need the righteousness of God, how? Without the law. Being witnessed by the law and, and, and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference for all of sin. And come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption. What's God's mind about the lost? What do they need? You folks know this. We're not, I'm not digging up new nuggets here. I'm trying to get you to think. How does God think about the lost? When you see lost people, what do they need to hear? The gospel, Paul's gospel. Hey, he died for you. Well, first of all, you're a sinner. We talked to a young lady at our swap meet outing. She did not even know what the word sin meant. So now you've got to educate them what sin is. <laughs> you think about that. But what is the mind of what is God's attitude about that sinner? They need to get what? Justified, saved. And he comes over and he says, Here, think about the courtroom. Paul, the prosecuting attorney, has laid it out. We've proved the case. The father says, you know what, you're guilty, be quiet, quit arguing, that's who you are, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sentence you to a second death in the lake of fire, absent from the presence of the Lord, absent from the presence of the Godhead, you have eternity to be that worm in the fire which not quenched. What do you think man's doing? Oh my goodness. And he says, you know what I'm going to do though? I'm going to take that sentence and I'm going to put it on my son who went to Calvary, and he did, and he died, and in those hours of darkness experienced that second death for you. And I'm going to make it available now, being justified how? Freely. I'm not going to require you to do anything. Come on over to chapter, well, you're still in three. I'm not going to require anything for you to do. You just have to believe me. Trust me. Look at verse 25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in what? His blood. Oh, you guys over there believe in a you know, human sacrifice. You've heard it. No. What do we believe in? We believe in the Word of God. What's the mind of God say? How's he thinking about this? And yet, what do we do with the law sometimes? We kind of tiptoe around them, don't want to get in the argument, don't want to talk to them, don't, this, you know, okay. No, what do they need to hear? They need to hear the gospel. Come on in in chapter 4. By the way, I, I'm not trying to read every verse. I'm hope, hopefully kind of getting the idea where we're headed here. What happens in chapter 4? What do we learn in chapter 4? Verse number Well, I had it. Verse 3. What do we learn? For what saith the... Hello? Hey, it's just church. Come on. What saith the what? Who wrote the scriptures? The Godhead did. The Holy Spirit, the work... Here's what does the mind of God say. Verse 5. What does it say? But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Do you see anywhere in there that says he he was already forgiven, he just doesn't know it? No. How does God look at this? He looks at it as, listen, they're lost, they're sinners, they need a Savior, they need a Redeemer, I've provided it. If you believe me, it will be imputed to you. End of case end of argument there's no need to carry on you with me how does he think about this 
Therefore, how should you be thinking about this? Well, Rick, you know, first of two admonitions, and we're going to reject them. I'm not, we're not talking about that. How do you think about it? Well, in the Greek and the Hebrew, no. What does this book say right here? That's what I'm trying to get you to think about, because we're going to get over in chapter 6, 7, and 8 now. But wait, we've got to get to 5 first. And you know what happens? When we start talking about identity and we start talking about walking and who we are in Christ and we start talking about all of those little details about identification, some of you have never read it. And I know there's an internet crowd, so some of them too. And you know what happens? You get all balled up with something and all I've got to do is remind you of something that you should have been reminding yourself all along because that's the mind of Christ. Romans 5. I Actually, stop on your way in verse 25 of chapter 4. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification? Who did the work? Jesus, Jesus, excuse me, Jesus Christ did. So in the mind of God, who's doing the work? You? There is no work you can do. You're none righteous. No, not one. Who's doing the work? Christ did. So when I come to this, I, that thing Charlie did today about the good works, that was great. I come to this not in my, it, I'm not talking about coming to this in the energy of my flesh. I'm talking about coming to it the way God thinks about it, because that's where we should be. Chapter 5, verse 1, great verse. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. No kidding, really? You love that, right? Then why do you think that whatever's happening in life is God getting even with you? And you're a believer, I'm not talking to the unbelieving world. I'm not talking about those caught in vain religious system. I'm talking about people who know better. It's right there. You know this stuff. And yet, what do we do? Well, God's trying to teach me a lesson there, brother. He ain't trying to teach you nothing. You are already at peace with him. He wants you to do what? Let's think that way. Well, you just don't know my circumstances. I'll tell you what, Paul had it worse, and he never complained about his circumstances. Rather, he used them to do what? Make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. See the gospel. Preach the word. Stand there and say, here's my... That thing in Ephesians... I I told myself, no rabbit trails. Man, Ephesians 6, he says, pray for me that I may speak boldly as what? As the ambassador for Christ. That's who you are. Wow, I only got one amen out of that. That's who you are, folks. I know, it's a little rough day. (laughs) By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Look at verse 9. Thank you. I take that hallelujah. Look at verse 9. Much more than being what? No, you missed it. You missed a word. Being what? What are you? Well, I'm working my way. I'm on the road. No. You are what? In God's mind, what are you? You're justified. See that? That's, man, what a, a different way to think about it. Well, I just want to work in them. No, you are justified. By his blood. Now watch this. We shall be saved from the wrath through him. Well, you know, Brother Rick, we had COVID 18 times, and man, God's just wrath pouring down on me. Really? You can chuckle. I had some folks say that to me, and they understand rightly dividing. They understand the grace of God. They're saved on their way to heaven, and that was out of their own mouth. And I said, hang on a second. What about Romans 5 now? Well, that's I know, talking about the future. I said, yeah, but if it's the future we don't see, what's he doing to you now? When we ran other verses. Come on over to chapter 6. i got to watch the time. Chapter 6. Folks, am I talking about stuff you don't know? I'm not talking about anything you haven't been exposed to, am I? How you think about it. You want real living? I titled this Real Living because I couldn't figure out any other title. It just sounded good, you know. You want real, to live as who you are in Christ? You have to think about 
things in life the way God thinks about it. If you don't, then you will stumble, fall, get frustrated, and quit. You will. Now, you'll never lose who you are in Christ or your salvation or justification or any of that, but you will allow the adversary to win the day. And remind me, i got a point about that here in a little bit, okay? 6-1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What's the answer? God forbid. Why is it God forbid? How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? See that answer? That's the answer. When he says, hey, should we continue sin? Oh, God forbid, divine pro... Why not? Verse 2. You know, he could have just ended the chapter in that verse 2, and that would, should have been enough. But he knows what he's dealing with. He, I, I, he knows who he's dealing with. So he goes into it. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. That, that, there's no doubt about it, is there? Do you have a doubt about your co-death, burial, and resurrection identity with Christ? You shouldn't. That should be cemented into who you are. That's in your DNA now. Ooh, there's that big booger word. Oh, don't do that. It messes up your DNA. I'm messing with your DNA, folks. Now watch verse 6. Knowing this. Now watch the mind of God. How he thinks about you justified in the body of Christ, in his Son. How does he think about you? Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that you would go out and just live any way you're other. That what? That the body of sin might be, what? Destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. Think about how God thinks about sin in your life we're talking about. The lost, he's already condemned it, he's dealt with that. But you, verse 7, for he that is freed, don't just say free, freed. See that? You're freed from what? Well, I don't know, Pastor, I'm just struggling. No kidding, you know why you struggle? You're not thinking like God tells you to think. That's why you struggle. You struggle with sin. What does that verse say? The body of sin has been what? Destroyed. It's crucified. You have been set free. No, you are freed. And yet what do we do? Oh, boom. I could just see the Holy Spirit going, would you dummy just get up? I really do. I think the Holy Spirit's got a great sense of humor. I really do. I, you, oh, I don't know, brother. You know, brother. No. I think he does. I think he looks over there and he says, Hey, look, man, when you get done beating your head up against that wall over there, then I'll go to work with you. But until, until you do that, I'm not down enough verses yet, so I've got to head on myself again. What's your identity? What are you here? You're freed from sin. Now, does that mean that sin will never creep up and do? No, it's not what he's talking about. He's talking about here's how God thinks about you and your life. How does he look at you? He doesn't look at you as a servant of sin. He looks at you as someone that's been set free from its control and dominion. You remember Colossians 1, because we ain't going to get there. What does the Father do? He makes us meet to, for to be partakers of the end. What is he? He's delivered us from the power of darkness and put, translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. What has he done? He's taken you from satanic captivity, and he has set you free in your justification, paying your second death, and then in your walk as a member in his, of his body, in time, in the moment. Amen. 
verse 8. By the way, I will say, don't miss how many times Paul says, knowing, in this passage. (laughs) You are to know this. This isn't a, well, maybe I do, maybe I don't. No. Knowing, knowing, knowing. Verse 8. He doesn't say knowing. What does he say? Now. See that? Now he's going to illustrate it for you. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. What are we talking about? You are dead to sin, but you're alive unto who? God. That's the Father. You've got to look at verse 11 a little careful. You're alive unto who? God the Father. Through who? Through Jesus Christ. How does he think about you? How's he looking at you? And by the way, I do this in my mind. All right, Rick, how's God looking at this? Verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield you your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto, I'm sorry, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Verse 17, he says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. How does God look at you in your daily activity, your daily life? How does he look at you? No, it's just another sinner saved by grace. No. He looks at you as free from the control, from the dominion, from the angst of it. Now, remember where we started in 417? Remember that little phrase I said? In the moment, does it feel like it for you and I? Remember 417? Go back to 417. Come on. Come on. 417. Actually, you know, in, when, when we were growing up, we were taught to write verses 417A, 417B. This is like 417D. <laughs> There's so much in this verse. But look at the end of that verse. And calleth those things which be not as though they were. How does God view you in this condition? But in reality, what are you? What's going on? The world's falling apart. Everything's up. It's a mess. What should I do then? I ought to be adjusting my thinking to think like he thinks. And you know what he says? You're already. You're in this condition. You're freed from sin. You follow that? You follow that? Okay. Chapter 7. Moving right along. Chapter 7. We learn in chapter 7 that we're what? Verse number 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in the newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. What do we learn here quickly? We learn what? We're not. We're dead to the law. But we're alive in who? Christ. Chapter 6, you've got God the Father. Chapter 7, you've got Christ. How does God view you when it comes to that law? He says in Colossians, what did he do? He took those handwriting of ordinances that were against us, and what did he do to them? Nailed them to the cross. Blotted them out. Took care of that requirement. And you know what happens? You put yourself... Again, what does God say? This is your condition... And yet, what are we in? Oh, no, now we're beating the tar out of ourselves, and we got ourselves on a guilt trip. We got ourselves underneath, underneath a, 
performance-based acceptance system, and the only acceptance we're looking for is our own. Because we're accepted in Christ already, aren't we? Again, it's stuff we know. It's sound doctrine learned, isn't it? But we just get this, this little dude here between the ears. There's a joke there, but we'll let it be. And what happens? We get all wrapped up into something, and somebody reminds you that you need to be over here, and you blow a gasket and World War X breaks out because you've already had World War III to nine. I'm sitting there going, what's, what is this? Don't you know this? Well, yeah, I've been in the message 50 years. Really? And you're going to blow a gas? Oh, yeah, yeah. Chapter 8. Sorry. Chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me, what, free? See that? Folks, you are set free. Do you know that you are a victor? That's why later down in in Romans 8, he's going to call you a more than conqueror. You're a part of a victory program. You got, you got victory. Oh, I don't know, Pastor Rick. It's just hard out there. No kidding. But that's the wrong thinking. How should your thinking be? Hey, I, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. By the way, the law, with the law comes the knowledge of what? Sin. And the wages of sin is death. Personal opinion, verse 2, has got chapter 6 and chapter 7 in it. You're dead, man. Now, in chapter 12, we're a dead man walking. Great show, by the way. Okay? All right? But see, the thing is, is I'm tr- I want to get your thinking here. How do you think about it? What's God's view? Man, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free. I could, again, the Godhead... Look at this guy over here. He says he knows it and he's not acting. You know, it's like you just you frustration. I just it's fun. anyway. Uh, verse eighteen. Well, I'm I'm sorry. Keep reading down. Verse eight. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot what? Please God. You know what we learn here in Romans eight, in the beginning of this chapter, that we're dead to what? We're dead to the flesh. But we're alive where? In the Spirit. So you've got six. God, the, we're, we're dead to sin and alive to God, the Father. Chapter 7, we're dead to the law, but we're alive in, in Christ. Chapter 8, what are we? Dead to the flesh, but alive in the Spirit. There ain't no place that are better to live right there. And I don't care what the temperature is outside, that's the place to be. You follow that? Verse 18. By the way, verse 15, verse 14, I just, we're, we're to stop. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. How does God view you? What does He call you right now? Something that in our reality is not there yet, is it? But what are we? The sons of God. We can cry, Abba, Father. The cry of maturity. The cry of an adult. He calls those things that be not. Life stinks, doesn't it? Normal's not coming back. Right? You know what? When I first saw that T-shirt, a little bit before Dad put it up, I'm like, thank goodness normal's not coming back. You know what the COVID, the break and all, you know what it did to you? It put death right in front of your face on a daily basis. It did. Well, I don't know. Yeah, no, it did. We had a family in, in Phoenix in the Valley area. Mom and dad got COVID right in the hospital. Grandma and grandpa, COVID right in the hospital. Aunts and uncles, COVID in the hospital. Brothers, two sisters, COVID, same family. There was an eight-year-old left. She didn't get it. That whole family died but that eight-year-old. Well, I don't know, man. I don't think you should. No. <laughs> hey, 
And she got placed with a, their close family friends and so forth and to be taken care of. But how about go up and say to someone who just faced the death of a loved one and say, hey, you know, have you ever thought about where you're going to spend eternity? And give them the, talk to them about the gospel. They interviewed the aunt. You know who she blamed? God. COVID did that. COVID put death right in front of you. COVID opened a great door of conversation about the lost. Because what are they facing? Or what they're facing death. By the way, COVID's not going away. They're just going to rename it. You understand that, okay? By the way, it was here before it was called COVID. I had it before it was called COVID. The other thing that COVID did was it made you realize you don't need a lot of the luxuries that you've got used to needing. You don't need a sports team, even though I'm Roll Tide Alabama. Amen, brother. That's exactly right. Nick Saban, Paul Bear Bryant, and God are buddies, man. They're right there, all right? No, I'm just kidding. Don't email me. I'm kidding, okay? You don't need a sports team. You didn't need certain luxuries that you got used to. It exposed a great deficit in our country, in our society, of a, of a breakdown of communication to our young people, didn't it? Yeah, it did. How do you think about that? How are you thinking about it? I would suggest you should think how God thinks about it. Because how does he think about it? I would have all men get saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's how I think about it. You with me? 818. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, you take that verse. What's going on? What is the, what is the characteristic of this dispensation in that verse? What's going to happen to you? Woo! It's going to be hurt, isn't it? You're going to suffer. Well, I don't know why I'm suffering. But yet, keep reading. What's God say? What does God call that isn't there yet, but what? As though it were. What does he say you are? Hello? Folks on the Internet, there are people in the room, okay? What are? You're, that's not worthy to be compared to what? Glory. There's glory. What's God have you? He's already got you seated in heavenly places, doesn't he? He already has you in glory, doesn't he? Look down. Look down. Come on. You're an eight. Look down there at verse, thir- uh, verse uh, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also, what? Is that present, past, or future? It's past. In his mind, it is done. What should my mind be? Same thing. I, I, now, I know right now I've got to go get on an airplane and go back to 115 degree heat and 40% humidity. I understand that because I chose to live there with my beautiful wife. Okay? But you know what? I look at it as what? I'm in glory, man. I'm glorified. I'm already there. I adjust my reality, my thinking in the moment to what? It's just glory, baby. It's just glory. Well, I don't know if I can do that. You can do that. Christ isn't talking about the future. He's talking about what Paul, Christ through Paul's talking about right now in time. What's your state? What's your condition? Look at verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Boy, what a question. You know why? Because sometimes when the suffering hits, you know what you think you've lost? You lost it. Where did he go? Where is he? No, that's, your th- that's bad thinking. Stinking thinking. 
How does God think? He says, you know what? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Any of that physical day-to-day life stuff going to impact you? Is it going to separate you from who I just told you in chapter 6 and 7 and 8, your, where your identity is? Verse 37. Nay, in all these things. All what things? Verse 35, 36. Verse 37, nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded. Belief beyond doubt. But some of you live in doubt. You do. Why? You don't know me. I don't know you, but I tell you what, you look at your own act, examine yourself. You look at your activity, and you live in doubt of this. I'm not saying you're losing your salvation or any of that. I'm just talking about in the moment that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Look at how God views your life. Your life is not the enemy. What does verse 37 say? You're a what? No, you are a more than conqueror. You understand that? Conquer, you go in, win the battle. But a more than, you take the, the spoils and turn it to your advantage. You understand that? What, how does God view your life? Well, if they just would learn this, then this, no. He says, no, you are a more than conqueror. That's who you are. Our gloom, our view is gloom, despair, and agony on me. If there was no bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom and agony and despair. You've heard Dad say that. You, you, I get a lot of my stuff from my dad. Okay. A little mannerism. Right, Charlie? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. That's our view, isn't it? Boy, life really is, yeah. Oh, man, the 401K's going down. Right? Yeah. Well, yeah, it is, duh. It's what happens. It's called life. But how do I view my life? Hey, how about a more than conqueror? How about looking at it going, you know what? I'm justified. I'm sealed with the Spirit. I got all spiritual blessings. I'm complete. I'm getting way ahead of myself. And I got all this stuff. Come over to 2 Corinthians 9. Don't leave Romans, but look at 2 Corinthians 9. It was looked at earlier. And we'll do it a little better now. Look at 2 Corinthians 9. And what happens is, is we get all balled up, and you know what we begin to forget? God has called things to be so that aren't necessarily in our reality. And you know what we have to do? We have to adjust our thinking to bring what he says is a done deal into our reality. Look at 2 Corinthians 9.8. I know he's talking there about being a cheerful giver and so forth, but and God is able to make all grace abound toward you. How much grace do you get? 75% because you didn't tithe. Oh, you gave. Okay, good. All right, now we're at 95 because you should have given an extra 5%. Come on. No? How much? All. That ye always having how much sufficiency? All. In all things may abound to every good work. And I'll just say, just kind of a parenthesis, a little cul-de-sac move here. No rabbit trails, cul-de-sac moves, okay? Is that every good work there is the issue of giving because of the context we're sitting in in Corinthians. We're talking about good works earlier. There's a giving, folks, is a good work. How you give it and so forth is there. But what does he say? You know why you're to be giving? Because you're thinking of, thinking is, I am totally and completely and adequately sufficient. I have it all. Paul tells uh, in, in Acts, I think it's to the Ephesians there, he says, I have held nothing back from you. I gave it all to you. Go back to Romans. We were in eight, right? How does God view your life? 
you're a winner. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. You're the winner. Well, no, man, it kind of stinks. Yeah, well, that's because he, did, he left you here to be a what? An ambassador. But how do I view this? I need God's thinking on this. I got it. I got sound doctrine learned. But I'm going to go here and beat my head up against the brick wall over there until it's bloody, figuratively speaking. And then one day maybe it'll work. No, it's to go now. It's to be there now. Chapter 9, 10, and 11, what do we learn there? Because, flip over, because of time. Oh, yeah, yeah. 11, 15. Romans 11, verse 15. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead. What do we learn in 9, 10, and 11? That dispensational change and the outfall of it and, the, and, and what's happened with this national Israel and, what God, and the fact that God's able to go and to do. So you know what? When I read the Old Testament and I start claiming, naming it and claiming it, guess what's going to happen? It's not how God thinks today about you. So don't think that way. How, do I, how am I supposed to think? I'll, be, I'll, I'll tell you. Look down at verse 32. Or, I'm sorry, verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways. Man, that's how you ought to think. Oh, the depth of the what? Wisdom. The riches of the wisdom. So we start chapter 12. Chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world. Uh Uh-oh, hang on. What happened there? What did Paul just do in verse 2? Don't let the world define you. Every one of us, at some point, lets the world define us. You know what that does? That gives the adversary the hook in to cause trouble. Remember the guy in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 2? I told you a minute ago I reminded something. I just remembered again. 2 Corinthians 2, he he sinned, they kicked him out, and they won't forgive him and bring back. And Paul says, forgive him, lest what? Satan gets an advantage, and the adversary gets in there. You know what he's doing today? He's looking for an advantage so you know how he gets that advantage? We have a big blow-up about this little thing called COVID. And you know what it does? It gets us to quit thinking about who we are, thinking the way God would think about it, and we start thinking how the world wants us to think. And it wreaks havoc in your life. And I'm not talking about being yay, nay, up, down, backwards. I don't really care. You can give me all the science you want. I got a dear lady, she does. I, you know what I did? I YouTubed half of what she gave me. I gave her more science back that her science was wrong. Come to find out, you know what? It was all wrong. <laughs> Duh. It's the world's definition. What's my definition? Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformed. I love that. That issue, transformers more than meets the eye. You know why? Because that's what you are. You go over and you think about that word transform. You think about that thing in, in, math, in the Gospels about being transfigured. When Peter, James, and Saul... Peter, James, and Saul. Really good, right? <laughs> what about Saul? Peter, James, and John, they go up on that mountain and they see the Lord and His majesty and His glory. They see the real deal come out, didn't they? They're witnesses of it. They see him talking with Elijah and Moses, and they're talking about the kingdom, and they got all that, and he sees, he's what? He was transfigured. Then Peter and them, they, they, you know, they're, they're sitting there going, wow, look at that. And they look down and make sure their shoes are tied. They look up, everybody's gone. What happened? They go back down the mountain, and, and off we go. Folks, why, who needs to come out of you in your life? Who you are in Christ. We just walked through it. Did we do anything you don't know already? You just the way you think about it. How does God look at you? He looks at you as a done deal, doesn't he? And you know what? We're to be transformed. We're to transform our thinking by the renewing of our mind. And I'll tell you, personal, private, 
I'm giving it to you because I believe it. Romans 4.17d tells you how some components of that renewing of your mind. God says, this is a done deal, man. It may not be done in my reality. I think about Brother Mel, we were talking about, he's, he's what, absent from the body, present with the Lord. It, that's not, his reality is different, isn't it? But he's still a done deal, isn't he? Your reality is your reality. You live where you live. You pay your bills the way you do. You live life. You're married. Every, every component of your life, God says, you're done deal, dude. Well, I don't know, man. I sure don't feel like it. He don't care how you feel. He says, you're done. You've been baked on both sides. The timer's gone off. You're done. Now let's go live and think it like that. We get it? I guess not. All right, Colossians. Come on over to second. Come on over to Colossians two. On your way, stop in Ephesians one. Ephesians one, verse three. You know the path. I'm not talking about anything we don't know. I'm trying to get you to reset your thinking. Ephesians 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. What's he done? Blessed. It's done, right? How many? Well, I don't know, brother. If I keep doing, do I get more? What? All's not enough? And you let your eye just run down through verse 14, and you know what he says? He says, you're holy. You're blameless. You're adopted. It's according to His grace. It's according to His will. You're accepted in the beloved. I love that. You know where I get my acceptance from? Not you. I'm sorry. I get it from who I am in Christ that I just learned in the book of Romans. And I take that and I go, you know what? Let's put it in shoe leather. And every time my wife messes up over here, she never does, but every time, okay, okay, You know what I do? I view her as who she is in Christ. And when I mess up, I never mess up. But when I do, you know how she is to view me? Same way. What, that means you never argue? Oh, no, we have arguments. (laughs) But it's with the perception issue. You know what it does? I, I was counseling a couple, a couple months ago. He's talking at death calm zero. You know where she's talking? Ten. I said, we've got to get you down to zero. to zero. I mean, and just loud. We need to come down here. You know what they were struggling in? Identity issues. He was getting her acceptance in something else. He's getting his acceptance here. And they were two ships passing in the night. Get them back in together. Follow me? You go to Colossians 2, quickly. I don't, know, I don't know what time we started. Don't really care. <clears throat> but I don't know what time we started, but doesn't matter. Okay, we're going to be here, right here, right now. Colossians 2. Colossians 2. Look at verse 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In who? Who's the him? We look at him, and who do we see? We see the Godhead bodily. Is that a done deal? Is there, is there another God going to come later? Not the God. It's done, isn't it? And ye are complete in him. Who? The one that demonstrates the Godhead bodily. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And then the what? The Word was made flesh and dwelt among men. And we beheld the glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And there he is. And you know what he says? You trusted my work at Calvary. And because you trusted that, and that alone, I placed you into my body through the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Father. I gave you my identity. That's what you're getting in Romans 6, 7, 8. You get his identity. Did sin have 
control over the Lord Jesus Christ. No, he was sinless. But yet, what did he still do? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I am not a man, I am a worm. What did he experience? Your second death. He says, I give you my identity. I give you victory in life. I've blessed you with all of it. I've made you complete. I've left you here on planet Earth to be my ambassador. It is a done deal. But you are to do what? Study. To show thyself approved. Unto who? Unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, but what? Rightly dividing. You, you're going to study, dude. I gave it to you, but I'm not, as Dad used to say, bore a hole in your head and dump it in there. It ain't going to happen. You're going to have to do what? You're going to have to willingly, deliberately make a choice of faith and study it. Take it and then apply it to the details of life. You're complete in Him which is the head of all principality and power. In whom? I mean, then he just breaks out in this glorious exhortation of the riches of the wisdom of God at what he's done for you. He circumcised you with a circumcision made without hands. He's baptized. He's quickened you. He's forgiven you. He's blotted out. And then in verse 15, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. Come with me to 2 Corinthians 3. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 13. And on your way, get Philippians 1. Folks, I didn't have a whole bunch of new stuff have we looked at anything that you don't already have heard? No. It's sound doctrine learned. I just want you to reset your thinking. Because where real living happens, reality living, okay? You got Philippians 1, you got 2 Corinthians 13. Just write down Ephesians 5. And you start in verse 18, and you run down into chapter 6, 10, and you read how Paul says God views your life. In, Romans, in Ephesians 5, 18 to 21, he says, here you are as the individual. What are you to do? Be not drunk with wine where is excess, but be who? Be what? Filled with the Spirit. What does the Spirit-filled life look like? I got a harmony in my heart inside of me. I got a thankful attitude to God. I got a submissive servant spirit to others. There it is. It's right there in those verses. God says, This is you. Well, I don't like that guy. Doesn't matter. That's why he's got Romans 12 where you live peaceably, maybe not just hang out with him, just go the other way. That's you. But then he says, What? Wives. Then he says, Husbands. Then he says, Children. Then he says, Servants, employees, employer, really. Where did he just go? He didn't go to the ivory towers of Yale and Harvard and Oxford and Cambridge. He went where? Right into the dirty details of your life, didn't he? And he says, this stuff's meant to impact that. But you have to renew your mind. You have to adjust your thinking about this. Philippians 1, verse 21. Folks, when we sing songs, and you got the hymn book, life begins at Calvary. Do you believe that? When we sing songs about complete in thee, or the, the, the great one, glorious freedom, or dwelling in Christ, do you believe that? Well, doctrine's learned, right? Then why don't you live like it? Why aren't you really living with that proper mindset about the details of your life? God says it's a done deal. I told you Philippians 1, right? 
Look at Acts 2. I'm, I'm, I said this a minute ago. Just, I'm, I'm sorry, Ephesians 2. Sorry. Just dance through there. A little cul-de-sac move here. Ephesians 2, 2, 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together one day, maybe in the future. No. What? Made us sit together where? In heavenly places. Where, though? You're already there in God's mind. Where's your mind? Well, I got bills to pay. Sure you do. If you don't provide for your own, you're an infidel. You're wor- you denied the faith. You're worse than an infidel. Why? Because the scripture tells, gives me ordered maintenance to my life. I got to go do. I made choices willfully of my own free will and volition to go get married and have a bunch of kids and to do. Then guess what? I got to go do. I got to go carry it through. But how do I carry it through? What's my mindset? Philippians 1, verse 21. In the day-to-day, folks, real living is living life as the Godhead would have you live. That's why Paul says, I, one of the reasons why, he says, verse 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Notice, for to me. How did Paul live his life? He was richer than rich in the Jews' religion, wasn't he? But he he counted it all but waste. That he may what? Win Christ. That's a mindset change. That is a renewing of the mind. That is a looking at life saying, you know what? It is better over there. It's better for me to be dead and absent from the body and present with the Lord than it is for me to think about the situation over here as being... He's in Philippians. He's in jail. He doesn't say, woe is me. Where's my bailout money? No, he says, man, you know what? If I die here, it's only glory, baby. It's only glory. Real living, folks, is adjusting your thinking. You know the doctrine. It's right there. It's just now let's go live it. 2 Corinthians 13, the end of this verse here, the end of this chapter, verse 11. Paul has been dealing with the Corinthians. In the beginning, it was a struggle for him, wasn't it? He at least wrote them at least four times, maybe five, depends on how you read a verse or three. He gets to the end. 2 Corinthians, they finally are coming around. And he says, finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, mature. Not going to, you know, you're going to mess up. By the way, how do you think about your mess ups? Christ died for that. So let's learn from it and never do it again. Be of good comfort, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Where am I getting my comfort? Word of God. Be of one mind. Oh, my goodness, look at that. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. I'll leave you with that verse. Life's life's rough, I get it. Randy Savage one time said, you take your enemies, he said, don't take your enemies and just pin them on the mat. You take your enemies and you get up on the top bunkle and you throw them on the ground for the maximum destruction. Life's in an enemy, I get it. But how, but how am I to view it? God says you're a more than conqueror in it. If you're doing what? If you're right where you're supposed to be. Taking the sound doctrine and applying it to the details of life. Finally, brethren, farewell. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the evening. We thank you for the word, for the look into it, for the exhortation. And Lord, I just hope that folks understand and grasp to have your mindset in the everyday. In your name we pray, amen.